Nice role. All right. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Samuel Winter, and I'm here together with my colleague Joachim Robakovsky. Uh, we work for a company called uh, Vector, and uh, Vector works with uh, testing and development solutions for vehicle electronics. So we are here to talk about uh, automotive uh, communication protocols. Uh, so uh, if I'm not sure if you've gone through this already, but so these days uh, vehicles, automotive vehicles like cars and trains and trucks and so on, have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, electronic controllers inside of them. Uh, taking care of these functions like the ABS and cruise control and so on. Uh, and uh, you can find these in your regular car, in trains, in airplanes, and uh, these electronic units are supposed to communicate with one another by some means, which is where automotive communication protocols come in. So uh, the agenda that we're, that we're going to cover, uh, we will start with a little bit of an overview of uh, network communication. And then we'll deep dive a little bit into CAN, Lean, FlexRay, Automotive Ethernet, and Smart Charging. And after this, you should be familiar, a little bit more familiar with each of those terms. So first, a little bit of history. Uh, since the 70s, the number of electronic functions inside of our vehicles have increased exponentially. Uh, the, this has resulted in uh, there being far more cabling inside of a vehicle. This also results in you know, more, elec more electronics, results in more electromagnetic fields, which results in more electric electromagnetic disturbances inside of the vehicle, which all needs to be handled by some means. Uh, on top of that, uh, so we had one wire per signal in the past, so your job in the past was to troubleshoot all of this somehow. So here we have a bunch of lamps, some computers down here, some sensors, and somewhere in this wire harness, something goes wrong, try to find it. Good luck. So the old paradigm we had, uh, for every signal, uh, every signal a dedicated wire. This resulted in really massive wire harnesses, and they were too heavy, uh, and they are difficult to bend and control. In a car, we have very limited space. We, have, uh, we can't uh, just pull a wire that goes from the back of the car through the passenger seats to the front of the car. It needs to go under the passenger seats and around some sharp corners and be twisted. And do that with a single wire, no problem. Do that with 100 wires, you're never going to make them fit. Of course, this also results in a lot of costs for just sheer raw materials. Again, the shortest uh, distance between the back of the car and the front of the car, okay, maybe it's just roughly five meters for that wire, but in reality, you need to bend it around a lot of sharp corners, so it ends up being 10 meters at the very least. Uh, and extensions are very complicated. If you, we just want to add one more electronic control, uh, electric controller unit, unit here, Maybe it only has five signals that it's communicating, but it needs to communicate those five signals to 10 other devices. So that's way, way more than five wires that we need to add to the network. So something needed to change and bus networking was introduced. So the idea is that they all, all of the electronic control units communicate on the same wire. The advantages are, of course, that we get with significantly smaller wire harnesses. We get fewer cables, it's much lighter, it's easier to bend and control. Uh, it's much easier to detect errors and problems. Uh, and it's very easy to make extensions. We can just plug in a wire here and we're done. Uh, of course, this uh, presents a new challenge because when you have one signal per wire, you just, okay, high voltage, low voltage, that's my signal. Uh, but what happens if both of these units are trying to send at the same time? Or how do we tell different signals apart? How do we tell the engine, sing engine speed uh, signal from the brake signal? So that's where the protocols come into the picture. So we will start with uh, CAM protocol, the first protocol. So CAM stands for Controller Area Network, and the topology can look something like this. They communicate over a twisted wire pair uh, that has terminations at the end of the bus. Uh, so uh, the termination is to prevent reflections and the wires are twisted for error prevention and we will have a look at that in a moment. 
Uh, but what's most notable is that on CAN, the communication is event control. So uh, maybe you have a sensor and your sensor detected something. Now it tries to send that signal. So anyone can send whenever, which results in that collisions may occur. So the CAN protocol needs to be able to resolve collisions somehow. So keep that in mind. We will get to that in a bit. But first, we're going to have a look at why twisted wires. So first of all, we can look at the CAN message by three means. So we have, of course, the differential voltage that because we're transmitting on two wires. So one wire sends uh, these voltage levels and the other wire sends these voltage levels. And we're looking at the differential between these when we're detecting signals. Uh, and of course, this is converted to a bit stream and the bit stream can then be packaged into a data payload with a header. The header contains the ID for this data package. So that's how we are able to tell different data packets apart. The ID is also used for something else, which we will get into. And then there is also a tail at the end of the data where the, the appearance of the tail is based on the content of the data. Uh, but again, uh, differential voltage. Why differential voltage? So if we have a look at one of these and we zoom in on it. So when we are sampling, on uh, CAM, let's say that we're sampling here. So here we have this differential voltage, okay? That's uh, zero that we're sampling here. Uh, but let's say that there was an electromagnetic disturbance right here. If we were only measuring on one wire, this sample point looks very much like this level. So we would probably assume that, okay, where this is this voltage level and not this voltage level. But we're sampling on two wires and the wires are cl very close together, they are twisted. So this electromagnetic disturbance that occurred here will affect the other wire by the roughly the same amount. And because we're measuring the differential voltage, we're f fairly unimpacted by this disturbance. So uh, on CAN, we're measuring on two wires, a twisted wire pair to gain some level of immunity to electromagnetic disturbances. But then we have the situation of uh, CAM being event controlled and that nodes, multiple nodes can send whenever they want to. How do we resolve simultaneous uh, transmission? So node A, B and C all want to send at the same time and by some process that we refer to as arbitration, they have determined that B gets to send. And then we determined that C gets to send and then, well, there's only A left, so A gets to send. But how did this happen? So first of all, it looks like this. So here we have the perspective that node A is seeing, the perspective that node B is seeing, and what node C is seeing. And here we have on the, or this is what they're trying to transmit, and this is what we're seeing on the bus. So when the bus is idle, we're seeing a bunch of ones on the bus. So ones on canvas are recessive, and zeros are dominant. Uh, so what? Uh, so when the bus is idle, we're seeing a bunch of ones, and so each of these nodes saw that okay, the bus is. Uh, idle, no one is using the bus, I want to start my transmission. And when they want to start their transmission, they start by transmitting a dominant bit, a zero, to claim the bus. So each of these transmitted a zero and they see a zero on the bus. Okay, the bus reflects what I transmitted, so I will continue transmitting. And then they start transmitting the bits of their IDs. And the first bit of each of their IDs was a one, so they all transmit a one and they see a one, so they keep transmitting. And then they all transmitted a zero, they see a zero. So they keep transmitting until node A transmitted a one, but the other nodes transmitted a zero. On the bus, we're seeing the dominant bit, the zero. So node A transmitted a one, but it sees a zero. So then it knows someone transmitted a dominant bit. That means I don't get to transmit anymore. So node A will stop transmitting. But node B and C, they both transmitted a zero, they see a zero. That means they get to keep transmitting. So they keep transmitting, they keep transmitting until node C had another one in its ID. So node C transmitted one, C zero, stops transmitting. And node B keeps transmitting until it has transmitted its entire ID uncontested. And if it was never contested for bus access while transmitting its ID, that means that node B has won. It had the highest priority out of these nodes in this particular message. 
and then it transmits the rest of its message, which looks like this. We're not going to go into detail, but basically after the transmission of the entire ID, we get some additional data that is used to protect our payload. And then we have uh, the Lean protocol, uh, local interconnect network. Uh, Lean is communicating on a single unshielded wire. So on CAN we had a, uh, a wire pair that we transmitted on and we were measuring the differential voltage. Uh, and this was for error protection, proofing against electromagnetic disturbances. But on Lean we don't have this. We're transmitting on a single wire. So first of all, we're a little bit more susceptible to errors on Lean. To deal with this, on top of uh, other means, we slow down, tr down the transmission on Lean. So CAN, can it has a um, transmission speed of rough, roughly one megabit per second, whereas here on Lean we're limited to 20 kilobits per second, which is the recommended max. You can exceed it, but mm, then you run into the risk of errors. Oops. Yeah. Uh, so since we're communicating on a single wire and we are a little bit more exposed to errors, Lean is using scheduled transmission. And another benefit of Lean is that it's very simple to implement. So a Lean topology can look something like this. We have a Lean slave, a Lean slave, a Lean slave, and a Lean master. And master is the one that holds the schedule and determines who gets to send when. Uh, so the scheduling can look a little bit like this. So we have a lean master and the lean master has access to the schedule and the lean master will look at the schedule and see, okay, I want you to respond. And it sends out the header and that particular slave that is waiting for this header sees the header and it's like, yeah, okay, that's me. Yeah, and it sends a response. And then the master goes through the schedule again, next header and the next slave responds, and the next header, and another slave responds. And then it cycles through the schedule like this until you switch schedule. Uh, to, do, to manage this, the nodes, the communication needs to be synchronized somehow. And on Lean, uh, when for most part, the bus is not synchronized. Instead, the synchronization happens when we're transmitting. So this header that the master is transmitting contains the ID of who is supposed to respond, but also this synchronization field. So first there's this sync break field of a long sequence of dominant bits to let everyone know that, hey, listen up, we're going to synchronize. And then the master sends out a synchronization pattern. Everyone get your clocks out and try to find these falling ad edges in this pattern. And if you can detect the falling edges, you're synchronized and then you're ready to receive the uh, ID and tell whether it's your turn to respond or not. And uh, yeah, so this is done this way because it's more cheap, it's cheaper to have this spontaneous synchronization. So then uh, Joachim will take over and talk a little bit about FlexRay. Okay, so uh, you have been now introduced to uh, the motivation why network uh, uh, communication has been introduced in vehicles uh, and the two first uh, standardized, um, uh, two first standardized network protocols like CAN and LIN, where CAN was a bit faster, LIN was a bit slower, less secure, but cheaper. And one of the uh, notes which we have today for the demo is this one. I will talk about it a little bit later. It's, uh, there are buttons from a steering wheel from a vehicle. So this is a typical uh, uh, use case where you would use uh, such a, uh, let's say, cheaper network uh, for. Uh, and then, of course, uh, when the demand came for higher speeds uh, in communication, uh, and a more secure way of transmitting uh, communication because of different uh, application areas that arose to help us uh, control the car, uh, FlexRay was introduced. So uh, typically, uh, FlexRay is used in uh, driver assistance systems. So for example, if we have some kind of active safety systems in our vehicle, which uh, is supposed to react on a uh, critical time, 
uh, you really don't want to have the situation where you uh, have collision between messages, right? Because you might have a lot of sensors uh, that are reacting at the same time and uh, everyone needs to send something and you don't want uh, important information to be, uh, uh, let's say, delayed because of prioritization issues. So there was a, a protocol that needed to be defined in order to um, uh, work with these kind of issues. Uh, so one typical example is a uh, break-by-wire system, uh, meaning that uh, we have uh, brakes uh, which are connected to some modules where we press the pedals, uh, we are sending some messages to our uh, ECU which is controlling uh, the braking behavior, right? Uh, also, uh, the wheels, they have sensors which uh, uh, are uh, measuring the wheel speed, so uh, perhaps you're going on a road which is pretty icy, uh, one of the wheels stops spinning because it loses some grip, then the uh, driver assistance systems or the um, uh, systems which are supposed to help you, they are going to introduce some kind of uh, behavior so that the car uh, can remain, uh, can keep the control. So when this kind of situation uh, uh, occurs, you really don't want the braking system to fail because of uh, communication issues. So the Flexray Consortium was uh, uh, started by OEMs, original equipment manufacturers. In our case, it's uh, the car manufacturers, like uh, we see here, like Audi, Volkswagen, BMW, Daimler, which is Mercedes or Volvo cars. Uh, the suppliers for the OEMs, for the, for the car manufacturers, are the suppliers which are providing the electronic solutions. Uh, so uh, it can be Bosch, which makes um, ECU that contains some kind of application to solve some kind of uh, algorithm uh, issue. Uh, and then we have other suppliers, for example, for the transceivers, uh, which we are using for communication, right? So for the physical layer, like uh, Freescale or NXP. So all of these uh, uh, parties, they were um, uh, trying to solve uh, uh, the issues uh, which the goals were set for, and some of the goals uh, we'll see here four points. First one is reliability and fault tolerance. So we want to uh, rely on our communication that it's going to uh, be successfully, uh, uh, successfully transmitting and receiving messages. Uh, we still want uh, fault tolerance. So for example, we want to protect ourselves against electromagnetic disturbances. Um, also, what was introduced in Flexray uh, is that you want to have redundant information, so you're not sending information only on one line, but you can do it on two lines. So if one of the line breaks, you still transmit the information on, uh, on the second one, which means that uh, you are, let's say, uh, doubling up the amount of, uh, amount of cables. Um, we, but we still want to keep it cheap, so cost efficiency. Uh, what was uh, detected was that uh, bus systems were perfect to do, uh, solve these kind of issues, so Flexray has been defined as a bus system. Uh, still, we want to have higher transmission rate, so uh, compared to uh, LIN, which is 20 kilobit per second, uh, CAN, high speed CAN goes up to 2 megabit per second, but usually in vehicles, uh, 500 kilobit per second is applied. Uh, and in flex ray on one of the channels you can have uh, 10 megabit per second. So if you're using two channels that transmit different information, you will have a higher throughput and you can get up to 20 megabit per second uh, transmission. Uh, and what is very important when creating such protocols is that it's standardized bus systems. Uh, when, we, when we have a standardized uh, protocol uh, and it's available to more parties than only a couple of firms, then, uh, and it's a good technology, if more, uh, if more of the companies are using this technology, it's, it's going to become cheaper. So it's important uh, for the car manufacturers to work together. So for example, uh, BMW is a great case when they introduce automotive Ethernet, which we'll talk about later, but they made it a standardized system in order to make the technology cheaper, uh, provided to other people as well. So typical topology, or the easiest topology of FlexRay, is a peer-to-peer -peer communication when you have one bus and you have two ECUs connected to it. So ECU one and two, they are terminated at the ends of the, uh, uh, of the bus and the determination resistance we see here, it's similar 
uh, approach as uh, for CAN, a bit different uh, resistance because of different frequencies on the bus. And, but we also see that it's a twisted pair. So if we would have two channels, we would have two twisted pairs. Uh, and the signal level for flex ray, it's also measured, uh, we are also measuring the voltage difference, but the, uh, the difference in this uh, measurement is that uh, when we are transmitting a uh, bit one, we have plus two volts uh, voltage difference. If we're sending a zero, we have a minus two voltage, uh, minus two volt uh, difference. So this is the, the big difference in, in, uh, in the on the signal level. Um, so if we extend our topology, uh, we can have the passive bus, as you see here, ECU one and two as before, and we just connect. Uh, we're just connecting along the bus other ECUs. Uh, and then there are other types of type, uh, topologies like passive star or even active star. But um, just for you to know, uh, there are not uh, many, at least I haven't seen anyone using it actively. So, so this is the most common, uh, common bus system. Um <coughs> to give you an example uh, now on how Flexray works compared to CAN, where in CAN uh, everyone can transmit whenever they want to, and the one who is able to transmit is the one who has the highest priority. So if we look at the road uh, over here on the right side, uh, we have uh, a bad traffic situation because perhaps everyone uh, finishes work at the same time, uh, they are trying to reach the road, but uh, uh, since everyone is uh, trying to reach the road and the road is not wide enough, it cannot take all of the cars. So it's going to be a traffic jam. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when uh, we are in the middle of the day, uh, the, the streets are pretty empty, it's easy for us to go, right? So this is more or less event triggered, right? We have an event, we finish work, everyone goes, it's a traffic jam, and there are situations where it's not. Compared to flex ray, if I would, uh, if I would make an analogy with um, uh, with uh, lifts when we are going to the ski resort, we know that the lift is going to come uh, with, uh, with a predictable cycle time. So we know that, okay, we missed this one, but we can take the next one in 30 seconds, for example. So we call this one event-triggered control and this one time-triggered control. So on event-triggered control, the transmission time uh, depends on the events. Whereas in time-triggered control, the transmission time is reserved. Meaning that the transmission time is already decided before the communication starts because uh, the transmission has been defined as a schedule, right? So at one point you can transmit, and the next point you can transmit, and so on, right? So you have a dedicated time in the schedule. Instead, on CAN, for example, uh, the worst case can, uh, can be that the multiple events occur at the same time, which uh, uh, yeah, leads to collisions, and collisions leads to delays. So the ones who is not able to transmit now will try to transmit a little bit later. So we're, we don't have a predictable communication like that. Instead here, since we have a schedule, we know who is coming after who, we know we can predict that the information is going to arrive at a certain point in time. So uh, event-triggered communication is referred to as collision sense multiple access, like CAN in this particular case, where we have events. We uh, access the bus at a certain point in time with different IDs on our messages. Uh, and FlexRay would be a time division multiple access uh, communication where we have uh, cyclic, let's say, repetition so, so the cycles are repeated with, uh, uh, with uh, defined intervals, where in each cycle we are repeating the transmission of a certain frame, right? So we have a dedicated time for each cycle for a certain frame that contains certain information. So to show you this, uh, <coughs> we'll go into um, a tool uh, which is called Canu. So if we look at the setup, we have a LIN network here. You can see LIN. Do you see back there? So we have a LIN network. We have a master ECU. We have a slave ECU. The ones which are not grayed out are the ones I'm simulating in my PC. 
the ones which are grayed out are the ones uh, which are perhaps connected to from the real world. So, so in this case, uh, on the Lin network, I have this module. It's called steering wheel right, so SWR. It's grayed out because I have the real module. So, and on my Flexray network, instead, I set up, let's go here. On my Flexray network, I have a couple of more simulated ECUs. So we have a lot of gray ECUs and one which is grayed out, DIM. So this is this ECU, right? And, and so maybe you can feel the difference that this one doesn't have very complex uh, functionality uh, uh, more than uh, button presses. We need to indicate that the button is pressed or not. Here we have some other information I will show you right now. So here I have my power supply, which corresponds to the battery inside of the vehicle. So its uh, battery has usually uh, around 12 volts, uh, um, um, 12 uh, volts voltage. And this one has 13.5, I think. So, but still, we see that this one is not lighting up. So we need to make it believe that we are inside of the vehicle. So I, as I'm simulating a lot of different issues, I can uh, stimulate this one to tell it that, OK, now uh, you should uh, show something. And we're turning it on. And so of course, this issue uh, is going to display uh, the vehicle speed, the engine speed, and some other information for, uh, for the driver to, uh, to know uh, whether something is wrong with the car or not, and in which state are we, how fast are we going, and so on. So I can, I can simulate the vehicle speed uh, by transmitting the frames with the correct signals, uh, the engine speed. I can even uh, change the gears. Uh, maybe I can show that we are going in reverse gear five, and stuff like this, right? So, so we are uh, we are actually manipulating what kind of information is transmitted to an ECU like this. So, since we are talking about flex ray, uh, and we are talking about the communication on flex ray. So here I have a trace window where we can see in real time what frames we are uh, transmitting and receiving. So if I'm pausing a little bit, so each of the lines here is a message that we are uh, transmitting or receiving on the bus. And you can see in the column DIR, the di uh, direction column, the TX is what we are transmitting from the uh, laptop. Uh, and the RX is what we are uh, receiving from the issue. So here we have a is uh, a message from the DIM, uh, the DIM module, which is this one. And we can see that this message has been transmitted in slot 18 in cycle 5. So we were talking about the, the rep uh, repetition of certain cycles, and, and they are going through a schedule which is defined in the description of the network, right? So in the description of the network, you're telling who is transmitting to who, uh, and how, is the how are the messages structured, and so on. Uh, and then on Lin instead, um, I have a, a receiving frame from our simulated node, which is the uh, SWR, the steering wheel right. Uh, and we are transmitting uh, from uh, the master and so on, right? So, so now if I'm pressing the buttons, let's say the upper one, the, as we see here on the picture, the exit button. We can see that we can see that there is a no button pressed or pushed, right? And this frame would look something like this. So the master is going to um, let's say request a message from this one, which contains the state of the button press. Did I miss something, no, Samuel? Okay, so let's keep going. So so now what you have seen is that we are working with signals mainly on each of the on each of the <coughs> networks uh, and and it's pretty straightforward we have a signal which tells us the vehicle speed the engine speed maybe if a uh, button is pushed or not uh, so it's kind of static information that is transmitted periodically with some kind of uh, uh, yeah with some kind of behavior uh, and the reason I'm telling you this now is because we are going to go to automotive Ethernet, so the, the, the demo was showed before uh, with a purpose. So automotive Ethernet is relatively new in the automotive field. Um, 
in 2008, I think, um, or se uh, eight or seven, BMW started to, to uh, investigate Ethernet as a solution to bring into uh, the vehicles. Um, but going from that uh, time, now we have some trends that have occurred in the automotive Ethernet uh, topic, right? So we have connectivity. Um, so connectivity, Internet of Things, we have some services that uh, we want to um, uh, add to our car. So th uh, examples would be infotainment by web streaming. So imagine an infotainment system in the car would be some, uh, let's say, audio, uh, music, right? Or video. The passengers in the back seat maybe want to stream some kind of a video service to, uh, to keep busy during the trip. Uh, some cloud services and backend applications. It can be that your car uh, provider or the manufacturer of the car you have uh, might have a service. Uh, if you crash, you want to have some kind of emergency call for them to be able to provide you some assistance. Uh, or you perhaps you have bought a car and you want to update the applications that are inside of the car. So you buy the car today, but next year the car manufacturer, they release some new features. Uh, and you would like to have them in your car, so you would like to update the, the software. Then we have another area, which is adaptive and autonomous driving. And in adaptive and autom autonomous driving, uh, you are using a lot of powerful sensors, like radars, lidars, cameras. So, uh, for example, now a camera, it might uh, detect several objects on the road. Uh, so as we see here on the picture, we have some traffic signs, we have uh, you know, a person going over the street and maybe a vehicle and so on. And the number of objects might uh, vary, right? And then the information which the objects contain might also vary. So, so the structure in the data which is going to be transmitted inside, uh, inside of the vehicle is going to be more dynamic rather than static, right? So you don't have single signals, you have now big objects and it's more oriented in that way. Um, yeah, and so, so also one of the things I would like to highlight is the uh, requirements for security and safety. So uh, during different symposiums uh, when talking about issues uh, regarding to automotive Ethernet, uh, there has been proven that uh, data from cameras can be manipulated, right? So imagine you have uh, your car which is communicating inside of the vehicle. You have some Ethernet communication with uh, uh, protocols which are available to the public, really. And someone hacks into your car, exchanges this camera information with camera information from another uh, place in the world. Let's say you're driving somewhere in Gothenburg, but your car thinks it's in New York. It's a big problem if you're able to do like this. Uh, so, so there are a lot of um, discussions about the security inside of the car. So it's completely uh, new uh, challenges that are arising. But we're not going to focus on the application areas. We're going to focus more on the physical layer uh, this time. Uh, and a typical topology for Ethernet is a point-to-point -point communication. So comparing to, comparing to uh, uh, the other uh, like uh, CAN, Flex, Ray, Lean, we had bus communication where we had one line, everyone was connected to that line, and here we just have one line between each of the issues. So if you uh, compare it to your home network, you have a switch, and your computer, your sisters, brothers, moms, and dads' computer are connected through a single wire. So <coughs> it becomes more expensive, right? You don't have a bus uh, system anymore, and uh, it's, it's a bit different. But uh, why was uh, the idea to bring Ethernet uh, into the vehicle? First of all, it's an established standard. It has been used in many areas before. There are many different protocols which can be used as a template to use for applications inside of the vehicle. So you have uh, one of the areas is office communication. So here in Chalmers, you have some internal network uh, or industrial engineering where you have uh, plants. Uh, where the plants are divided into some kind of cells and these cells are controlled by a cert central system, for example. The aerospace industry, so Airbus uh, has created their own protocol which is called AFDX uh, and also vi uh, vehicle diagnostic access. So this was the first um, vehicle uh, implementation of Ethernet. So um, talking about vehicles now, imagine that the more 
uh, functionality you have in a car, the more software you have in a car. Uh, and the more software you have, it takes longer time to, to load the software into the car. So imagine you produce a car, it's on the end of the line, you're trying to load some new software onto it, it takes a long time. It, it, at least it did very long, uh, or, uh, perhaps 15 years ago, but now since Ethernet has been introduced, it goes much, much faster. Uh, so the strengths of Ethernet in automotive is that you have scalable bandwidths. You can, you can go between 10 megabit per second, 100 megabits per second, 1000 megabit per second. So depending on what you're going to use that specific network uh, system for in inside of the car in a certain subsystem, uh, you're going, you are able to choose which speed is uh, sufficient for you. Uh, it's flexible, you have many different protocols th which you can use for completely different applications. But the weakness is the wiring which comes from the regular office Ethernet cabling. The reason is uh, that it's not suitable for motor vehicles due to bad electromagnetical compatibility and mostly because of the uh, disturbance which is uh, produced by, uh, by Ethernet communication. Uh, and in order to get rid of this, we need to shield the cables. It becomes an expensive solution, which is not acceptable when you're producing million cars a year. So, a new standards were introduced for automotive Ethernet. Uh, and the standards which you're using at home uh, is 100 base TX or 1000 base T, depending on the uh, speed that is going uh, in your network. And in cars, you have 100 base T1 and 100, uh, 1000 base T1. So if we look at what the wiring would do look like, so 100 base TX, let's start with this one. We have an ECU1 and ECU2. So one of the lines is dedicated for the transmission of ECU1, and the other line would be dedicated for transmission of ECU2. So meaning that we have full duplex where one of the issues is transmitting on one line and the other one on the other line. On 1000 base T, you have two lines for transmission for each issue, which makes we have the double the cable. So, so we have eight wires here, right? So when this problem was approached, uh, the company which took this challenge was Broadcom. So the first version of Ethernet for vehicles would call, uh, was called Broad R Reach. When it was standardized in uh, IEEE, uh, it became 100 base T1. So what Broadcom was uh, able to do is that they were able to change how uh, the way the signals were transmitted on the, uh, on the physical layer in order to uh, reduce the, uh, the disturbance and, uh, let's say, be compatible for motor vehicles. And they were able to do it on just a single pair. So you had full duplex on two wires now. And it's 100, uh, 100 uh, megabit per second and 1000 megabit per second. But what is the problem? Uh, we will come to that soon. What is the challenge with this? So first of all, when we are transmitting uh, from, uh, from ECU1, we are going to add the voltage which is currently on the line. And when we are receiving, we are subtracting whatever is on the line uh, from whatever we are, uh, no, whatever we are sending, we're subtracting from whatever is on the line. So we know what is being uh, received. So if we are going to connect ourselves to these wires, and the signals are, let's say, the inverse of each other from uh, both of the issues, we're not going to see anything. So, the, so we cannot probe the wires just as uh, we could in the office Ethernet where we have one transmission line and one receiving line and we can just listen to the information. So what happens is that uh, as you, if you want to analyze this, you have to cut the line, you have to put some measurement equipment and, let's say, swap the information between the two of the lines. And this, uh, uh, this makes that it's required to have two Ethernet controllers. And if we would like to measure uh, whatever is happening between the path from A to B, right? We have an issue A and issue B, and we have several uh, routers or, yeah. Uh, so how many channels do we need in order to listen to this? 
4 pass. So it would be 8, right? So we need to break it up here, so it's 2, break it up here, 2, 2, 2. So it becomes expensive to, to, to uh, work with these kind of measurements. Plus that the communication, uh, uh, let's say, tools, uh, analysis tools are uh, more complex and it, also, uh, and it also brings the more expensive part. So smart charging communication comes out after automotive ethernet. So we, here we have been inside of the vehicle and we're going to go a bit outside. Perhaps you have seen the charging station, which is for the buses, the pantographs down by the bus stop. Uh, also on uh, many uh, parking lots more and more, you can see the uh, charging stations like this. What they have in common is that they are using the same uh, standard for communication, which is called uh, CCS, combined charging system. And what happens when we are connected to a charging station is that the charging station is connected to a power, li power line. So we are talking uh, to the charging station between the current charging station and the power line communication. Uh, so, uh, and this is based on uh, uh, a technology called Home Plug GreenFi. Uh, maybe you have seen uh, modules where if you want to extend your network uh, in your room or home, um, you can uh, buy these modules that you can connect to the socket. Uh, and if the wires are the same between two rooms, you can use that, uh, those wires as a medium for transmission of Ethernet communication. So you don't have to drag wires uh, all around the house uh, if you're lucky enough. And, and this is more or less how, it's, uh, how it works here. So you have uh, a power line where you're transmitting some Ethernet information. But if we have all of, the, uh, all of the charging station on the same power line, uh, we have to prevent that uh, our vehicle one is communicating with our charging station one and not two. So how do we do that? Um, so in order to prevent what is called crosstalk, there are ways to attenuate the signals from the other, uh, from the other charging stations in order to uh, not pair with them or let's say, uh, uh, start the communication with them. Um, so typically the communication between the vehicle and the charging station looks uh, like this. Uh, they have a handshake uh, according to the TCP protocol in order to say, okay, now we are communicating with each other. Uh, they're negotiating what standard you're going to use, uh, what services are we going to have. So are we going to charge the car? Or are we going to uncharge the car? Because during certain times of the day, perhaps it's, uh, you don't need the car, but you can sell the energy back to the, uh, to the grid. Uh, you have to negotiate payment, who is going to pay, right? Uh, and this uh, has to be uh, protected information. So we have some uh, certificates in the protocol. That's why uh, Ethernet comes handy, because it has been used already. Um, and then charging parameters. How much uh, current are we going to load the vehicle with? Because the different vehicles uh, have different batteries, right? Uh, and then we have our charging loop. We are finalizing the charging. And finally, when we are stopping the charging, we can take out the, the plug. So, so the communication is even outside of the vehicles, as you see. It's not just to plug in to the, to the socket and uh, charge the car. So summary. Oh. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we will try to cover the summary in the remaining uh, minutes here. Uh, and the summary we will cover is with uh, with regard to uh, implementing impl implementations and challenges. So on CAN, uh, CAN is uh, widely implemented and utilized. You will find it everywhere. Uh, you will find it in airplanes, you will find it in coffee machines. It's tried and true, it's been around for over 30 years. And if you get to work in uh, any industry, like if you start to work at Volvo, or if you start to work in with uh, an aerial uh, development com uh, company and so on, you will see CAN protocol. And CAN is not going anywhere anytime soon. So it's one of those protocols that if this industry interests you get used to seeing CAM. Uh, so yeah, it's tried and true. Uh, the challenge is uh, to implement and create uh, faster transceivers for, uh, to boost the data transmission. So the next upcomer is called CAN XL. 
On Lean, uh, Lean you will find implemented in simple non-critical units in uh, vehicles such as the steering wheel buttons because you won't notice if uh, there is a tiny, tiny, tiny delay between when you push the button and when the actual volume was increased on your radio. You won't notice that delay. Uh, so it's for non-sensitive communication. And the challenge on the lean is to implement the optimize the perfect schedule to minimize the idle time on a lean communication network. And uh, then we have some uh, flex ray. Perhaps I can do like this. Yeah. So flex ray, see um, implementations. So electric electronic assistance systems, brake by wire, steer by wire. Challenges. So measurement requires uh, uh, schedules and synchronization details. So if you would like to be able to join. Uh, the communication and manipulate some data, you need to know how the schedule looks like and you have to synchronize with the other nodes. Uh, and it has been a big challenge for many of uh, the users which uh, we are working with daily. Uh, it's not as straightforward as can. Then we have automotive Ethernet implementation. So we have the advanced driver assistance systems uh, where we have the cameras and the radars and so on. Connectivity, the Internet of Things, uh, we want to have some extra features in our vehicles and uh, this is a, a good way to solve the problem. And the uh, communication is service oriented, it's not signal oriented as it was on, uh, as we saw, uh, Canon, Flexray and Lin. It's more that, okay, yeah, I want to subscribe to this service, but when I don't want to have that service, I don't subscribe to it, so I don't receive a lot of data which is unnecessary. Um, Challenge, so the measurement uh, requires two uh, transceivers per measurement unit, uh, more and advanced equipment. Uh, of course, uh, many protocols, they utilize handshakes before procedure, so in order to start some communication, first we have to set up the communication, right? So who is talking to who, what ports, and so on. Um, so we cannot replay data, you know, uh, as on CAN, for example, we could log a lot of communication and then we could replay it, just push it to the bus. Uh, and on f uh, Ethernet, it's not like that. We have to establish the communication with the nodes before we can transmit something to it. Then we add some uh, uh, certificates and so on, so it's not going to be uh, that simple and straightforward. Uh, smart charging communication implementation. Secure communications over power lines between vehicles and charging stations. So we want to be able to trust uh, the system that we are going to uh, be able to uh, handle payments and so on uh, with the smart charging communication without uh, risking to lose our data, uh, like sensitive data. Uh, challenge. So develop product which complies with the standards. So now we have, uh, we have uh, car a lot of car manufacturers that are working with development of uh, electrical vehicles. We have a lot of manufacturers which are working on development of the charging stations. And uh, a car manufacturer doesn't want to buy a lot of different charging spots in order to make sure that it works with everyone. So you have to follow a standard very strictly, right? So if you follow the standard and you comply with it, then you, you should be sure that every, it should work with every charging station. And the same uh, thing applies to the uh, charging spot uh, uh, manufacturers. They, need, they don't want to buy each and every car uh, before being able to say, okay, yeah, our, our charging station works with it. Um, yeah, so that's that. And, and uh, just taking one or two more minutes off of your break. Uh, so before we came here, I took a quick look at job offers from uh, on Volvo Cars website and what they had off uh, what they were offering in Gothenburg uh, on uh, that date they were offering 44 jobs of which uh, many mentioned uh, Ethernet communications in uh, relation to vehicles so some of the things that we've talked about uh, nine of these explicitly mentioned that uh, automotive communication protocols one or some of the ones that we've talked about are a requirement or a merit for the job and uh, at least three mentioned specifically charging communication because the electrical vehicle is coming. And if any of these was what we talked about today was vague or if you weren't listening at any point during today, 
you can find out and learn more whenever you want for free at this website. So that's everything for us. Thank you very much.